Good morning. I want to welcome you to worship. This is the Lord's house. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that we come and we worship him this day and we offer him our praise, our gratitude, and we pledge ourselves to his loyalty and to his service. May God bless you as you enter into this time of worship and praise. May those of you who are with us by live stream, God bless you where you are. And may you be warm in heart as well as in spirit. Uh, also, to those of you who will be joining us later on, maybe this afternoon or throughout the week, as you come on YouTube and also on our Facebook recording, may the Spirit of the Lord be known to you in a very present way. God bless you as you come and as we worship Him this day. I want to make a few announcements before we do begin our formal time of worship. Uh, I have a note. It's from, it's to First Presbyterian Church. Thank you all for the prayers and the cards that we received for Charlie's mother, Faye McCants, during her death and during her time uh, of grieving for us. It's been a blessing to be members of such a caring church. May God bless all of you. Signed again, Charlie and Gina McCants. And this card will be on our bulletin board down here in the lobby of the educational building, so you'll have time to read that further. And uh, thank them. God bless them, Charlie, you and Gina, as you continue your grief process. We're getting ready for an adult mission trip. We have several who are you know, signed up for that, uh, and their names are listed here. We want you to uh, help us support them. Uh, they, they're selling one of the things, a uh, mission fundraiser, is sweatshirts, one-fourth zip shirts, and fleece vests. You have some information. Looks just like this. Also, just a contribution will be greatly appreciated as well. On the flip side, we have our financial report for December 2023, and God is certainly faithful through his members here, as you can read on that uh, financial report. He blesses us in so many wonderful and marvelous ways. Down at Shady Grove Baptist Church, uh, the first Saturday, February the 3rd, 10 o'clock in the morning. This will be for an hour or maybe a little over an hour, not much longer. We have, uh, we have an Alzheimer's, uh, 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 Alzheimer's and workshop that's going to be down there. It's every month, every month, the first Saturday, uh, there's, a, there's a, a schedule here. You can read about that, and I think it would be greatly beneficial to all of us, some of you know Tammy Mosteller. She lived here in our community for, uh, for a good while, and uh, she is the one who works in this field and will be uh, presenting this information as an educator, nurse educator with us. So no cost, uh, but just be aware uh, that that resource is available for you. Our schedule today and this week looks like confirmation today at 4 o'clock, then this evening at 5 to 6.30, our senior highs, PYC, and then they have a other uh, schedule listed here. Tomorrow evening, tomorrow evening at 6.30, we will begin our adult Bible study on the book of Acts. We're looking at the second study section of this, which is uh, chapters 9 through 21. Uh, and then later on in the spring, we'll be looking at... Uh, at uh, 21, 22 uh, till the end of the chapter. Coffee and yarn on Tuesday morning, 9.30. We also have devotions at Somerset at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning. Cub Scouts are meeting Tuesday night. Uh, you can look and see there. We're, we're getting ready for Scout Sunday here pretty quick. Our care team, E, will be the ministry team this week, and you'll certainly want to uh, be keenly aware of that. Uh, again, on Wednesday morning at 10, our Bible study. It's also a wonderful Wednesday, but you'll need to sign up for this. Please let us know that you're coming to our 
congregational meal, which starts at 530. Uh, you can sign up for that down here in the lobby of the educational building or just give us a call here at church. Uh, we just need to know that so we'll have enough food prepared for you. Of course, our Solid Foundations Counseling Substance Abuse Counseling Center is open on Wednesday and Thursday. You can read about those as well. On February the 4th, our annual community memorial service this year, 3 o'clock in the afternoon at Shady Grove Baptist Church. And uh, other announcements are here. Of course, I want to encourage you to look at the uh, thoughts and prayers section of our announcements. They include members of our church. They include our shut-ins, friends and family of our church members, our military, and other things, ministries to pray for, especially we lift out every week uh, our partnership church in Guatemala, the Golgotha Presbyterian Church, and of course those dealing with substance abuse addictions. Our sister church to be in prayer for is the Montreat Presbyterian Church in Montreat, North Carolina. And we do extend our Christian sympathy to the families of Mary and Gary Beam and Kathy Brown at the recent death of their brother-in-law and church member, Mr. Jim Sellers. Uh, Jim and Martha moved out to uh, Texas just, just a few short years ago to be with uh, children. And uh, Martha, of course, passed away uh, a couple of years ago, and, and now Jim has passed away just recently. We want to remember that family in our prayers. Service will be announced at a later date and time. Of course, we encourage you to remember the ministry here at First Presbyterian and also the other Christian churches throughout our area. Are there other announcements that I'm not aware of? Let me tell you, it's sure good to see you. May God's blessing be upon you. May he lift you up. May you praise him as he is worthy. And also may he be meeting your need. I'm going to ask our choir to open us with our time of worship. And God bless them as they do. Bless us. Choir.
Almighty God, in every age you have called out men and women to be your faithful servants. We believe you have now called us to join that great company who seek to follow you. Grant unto us today and always a clear vision of your call and strength to fulfill the ministry assigned to us. We pray as we worship in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he who blesses us with many blessings and especially with the gift of prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, what is it the Christian church believes? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I have quite the gaggle, but I know there's kids out there. Yeah. Can I have all kids come forward? Uh. Okay, so I'm going to need your help telling the story today, okay? okay? Just find a spot. I know there's jackets. I know there's, we can move some stuff. <laughs> okay, so... I need to know, how many of you have heard of a man named Jonah before? Jonah? Have you heard of a man named Jonah? So Jonah was a prophet of God. He would listen to God and tell the people what God said. One day, God said to, to Jonah, go to the city of Nineveh and tell the people who live there that they are very wicked people and that they need to change their lives. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. Show me how you would tell God no. Can you show me? Mm. No! No! You show me, yeah, it's using sign language. No! <laughs> he didn't like the people in that city, and maybe he was afraid of them. So Jonah decided to run away and hide from God. Okay, we're going to make running noises. Put your hands on your knees, and then you're going to go. So he ran away from God. He caught the first ship out of the town and headed in the opposite direction of where God told him to go. Now pretend like you're rowing a boat. Row. Perfect. <laughs> Jonah learned a very important lesson that day. He learned that you might run from God, but you cannot hide. Jonah got on the ship and hid way down deep inside. Surely God wouldn't find me here, Jonah thought. And now I want you to curl into a little ball. Curl into a little ball. Because God can't find you there. Mm. But God sent a big storm and tossed the boat around. So much that the other sailors thought they were going to drown. Whoosh. They found Jonah at the bottom of the ship. Who are you and what are you doing here? Jonah answered, I am a worshiper of, God, of the God of heaven who have made the land and sea. Jonah told the sailors that he was running from God because he didn't want to go to Nineveh as God had told them to do. 
When the sailors learned that Jonah was running from God, how do we run from God? We, good job. They were even more afraid. What, what, what should we do to stop the terrible storm? The sailors asked, throw me overboard into the sea, Jonah answered, and the sea will become calm. The sailors picked up Jonah and threw him into the ocean and the storm stopped at once. Did Jonah, did Jonah drown in the sea? No. no, God sent a giant fish to swallow Jonah and he was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Do you think being inside the fish was good smelling or was it stinky? <laughs> stinky. Spending all the time inside the great fish gave Jonah plenty of time to think. He prayed to the Lord from inside the fish. He confessed that he had been wrong to run from God and promised to fulfill his promises to God. God caught the fish. God caused the fish to spit out Jonah on the shore. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah again and said, get up and go to Nineveh and deliver the message that I have given to you. This time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. Okay, so we're gonna act like we're obeying. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> Just as God had something for Jonah to do, he has a plan for you and for me. I hope we learn the lesson of from Jonah when it comes to doing what God wants us to do. We might run, but we cannot hide from God. So let us pray. Show me how we pray now. Oh, perfect. God, we know we can't hide from you. You know what we do and what we think. Give us the strength and courage to do all things that you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Thank you, choir, so, so much. It's one of those hymns that you actually feel like just saying as the pastor of a church, okay, amen, let's pass the plate and we'll all go home. You know, we've had a wonderful sermon right there. Uh, I want to ask you to prepare your hearts right now as we come consciously into the presence of the Lord. We, we know that God is with us at all times, but sometimes we in our weakness, uh, sometimes in our busyness, sometimes in the hustle and the bustle of life, we, we find ourselves feeling too alone, too often without God, and yet He is there right now, consciously, consciously enter into His presence. Heavenly Father, we count ourselves blessed this morning. For we as believers in and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ enjoy this precious privilege of coming to you in a conscious state of being, conscious state of mind, a heartfelt experience with you in prayer. Our hearts are overwhelmed. But two, we're saddened to realize that this is not true of all people. We wish that all people everywhere would become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe that although the world would not be perfect, not until you come until you establish your kingdom anew, that it certainly would be a more peaceful world, a place where we could live in harmony, and a place where we could enjoy you so much in the now as we're going to in our perfection to come. Lord, many of us confess that we know this to be true, but yet we lack the zeal when it comes to praying for folks who have yet to come to faith in Jesus Christ. We confess that sometimes we lack the faith and the power of your name to answer our prayers. Your word tells us that even while we were yet lost in our sin, you died for us. You made it righteousness before our very lives and in our lives. even when we were in our sin. Lord, we pray this morning that for any of those sins that are left bare before you now, that you would strengthen our faith in this power of prayer and stir up our hearts to pray for the conversion of the peoples of this world and of our country, of our community, so that your kingdom of peace might come and your truth might reign in the kingdoms of all people. We pray specifically for the country known as the United States of America. And we are grateful unto you for the privilege of living here a land which we still honor the freedom to worship you as we believe that we are led by your spirit. We pray for the church in America that would rise to the challenge that we are experiencing here to be both witnesses and influencers helping to shine your light to all of the dark corners of our land. We thank you that we here at First Presbyterian Church have shared in that privilege. 
And we ask you, O Lord, to increase our brightness. We pray, O Christ, that you would use us as individuals to brighten the corner where we are, just as you use us collectively as the church of Christ, whom the Lord Jesus Christ said, you are the light of the world. You have been a shelter unto us, a place of refuge for our sometimes weary souls. When our hearts have become overwhelmed, we have turned to you out of our sickness and out of our grief, out of our hurt and sorrows to lead us to the rock of our faith that we know and love even as Jesus Christ, our Lord. We relish that peace that passeth all understanding that descends upon us when we come to him. Lord, we come to you now in our consciousness and in our hearts. Here as we cry out to you, O oh God, attend to the prayers of your people, we pray. For we come in Jesus' holy and precious name. And we thank you for hearing our prayers of the past and our prayers of the future, those that are unfolding even now before us. We thank you for answering our prayers in accord with your perfect will and not ours, for we pray as our Lord did, not my will, but thy will be done. As always in faith, we pray in the powerful name of you that we know and love as our Savior and that we strive by the power of your Holy Spirit to know you as our Lord. Hear our prayers this morning, those that I lead aloud and those that are coming to you now within the silent places of our hearts. And we all pray in the name of our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Matthew 6, 21 reads, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us now hold and embrace these words as we bring God his tithe in our offering.
Lord, indeed, it is an honor to be encouraged and invited and commissioned by you to be your workers, your servants in this world. We pray the gifts that you have bestowed to us in all manners through us being the conduit of these precious gifts would serve others in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom our very lives seek to glorify and to bless. It is in your name, our great blessing, we give and we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> this morning, we're, we're beginning a, a new time in our new year. We're thinking about uh, uh, perhaps looking at some scripture that we're very familiar with, but looking for a new discovery as God's Spirit leads us. And this morning we're looking at that gift of prayer, which is very powerful. You know, God has given you and me tremendous powers. And those powers can come through the gift of prayer, one of his most precious gifts. It can come through this choice that we could make to either bless or curse people. God has given us that power. We choose to follow his guidance by blessing others. And one of those, of course, is exercising the gift of prayer. And this morning, to begin our teaching, we're going to be looking at a couple of passages concerning prayer, one in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, and then over in the epistle of James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 18. So you can find that in your Bible or your pew Bible. You can read along silently as I read, or you can just enjoy here, hearing God's Word be read and blessed as you hear it, because I honestly do believe that God always blesses the reading and the hearing of His Holy Word. We begin our lesson this morning with the book of Acts. Let us listen to the word of God, chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. About that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. And when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. Now, this took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him. He placed him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial over the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed for him very earnestly. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate when suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off of his wrist. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put your sandals on. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel, but all the time he thought it was a vision. 
He didn't realize it was actually happened. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street and the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. This is the first reading of our lesson in Acts 12, 1 through 11. Again, listen to the word of God from the epistle of James. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call on the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil. In the name of the Lord, such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was a human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. This is the word of the Lord for the for the people of the Lord. Thanks. Amen. A woman was being interviewed by, well, by those officials for a jury selection. Uh, she says to the judge, now, I don't believe in capital punishment, so you know I, I can't serve. But ma'am, the judge replied, this case is about a man who promised his wife an expensive necklace for their anniversary, but then he blew the money gambling. She said, oh, in that case, I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Although you and I change our minds on an almost continual basis, it might be interesting as we begin to think and look at prayer, this question, does God ever change his mind? Does God ever change his mind? Although you and I change our minds on an almost continual basis, it might be interesting to consider whether or not God ever changes his mind. Now, some of you might be ready, ready to throw out some verses on me about Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Or in Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord I do not change. But you know, when we take a good, careful look, when we dig deeper into these verses, in their context, we come to understand that the writers are saying that God never changes his character, not his mind. Does God ever change his mind? Well, I guess it depends on your point of view, doesn't it? For those of you who are willing to have your point of view shaped by the Bible, it may surprise and even shock some of you to know that God not only changes his mind, but he often does so at the urging of his people. We begin to see this in Genesis chapter 18 when God makes Abraham aware that he has decided to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. When Abraham hears this, he decides to go to the mat. He hits his knees and before God on behalf of his nephew Lot and for all of those who live in Sodom. Listen, this is what Genesis 18 says records Abraham approached him and said will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked 
Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you still sweep it away and not spare it for those sakes? Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Why, you would be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same. Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the Lord replied, Well, if I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare the entire city for their sake. Then Abraham spoke again. Well, since I have begun, let me speak further to my Lord. Even though I am but dust and ashes, suppose there are only 45 righteous people rather than 50. Will you destroy the city for lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. Then Abraham pressed further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of 40. <coughs> Excuse me. And you know, Abraham continues his prayer before God. He continues a prayerful bargaining until God agrees to change his mind and save the twin cities, even if as little as 10 righteous people is found. But you know the sad news. There were not 10 even found. The good news is that Abraham's prayer had a great, powerful, and wonderful result for Lot and his family. But the cities themselves were destroyed for the lack of 10 people between those huge cities. The Bible is chock full of amazing stories of how God is willing to change his mind when his people ask him, yielding great power, wonderful results. Exodus 32, 9 and 10 tells us God was preparing to destroy the whole nation of Israel and begin anew with Moses. But Moses pleads with God, change your mind about this terrible disaster that you're threatening against your people. And verse 14 says, so the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster that he had threatened to bring on his people. The Lord changed his mind. Oh, come on, really? That's what it says, but why? Why would he do that? Because Moses prayed. One little speck of a human being asking the creator of the whole shebang to change his mind, and guess what? God does it. Isn't that amazing? God does it. Because Moses prayed, one little speck of a human being asked the Creator, and it's changed. Hezekiah was king of Judah at the time of the invasion of the Assyrians, and Hezekiah knew that the people of Judah deserved the cruel fate that God was going to allow the Assyrians to inflict upon them. Even so, Hezekiah prayed. It's recorded right there in 2 Kings 19. He asked God to spare him and his people, and guess what? God granted his request, Hezekiah's request. Peter was arrested, imprisoned, waiting trial, being guarded by 16 Roman soldiers. Peter's friend James has been beheaded by Herod for being a leader of the infant church. Everybody knows the same fate awaits Peter. Even so, his friends began to pray earnestly. And Peter is miraculously saved. He's released. He gets away. No wonder James assures us that the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I tell you, things happen when God's people pray. Let me say that again in case you didn't get it. Things happen when God's people pray. Say it. 
Things happen when God's people pray. The history of nation and peoples have been changed because someone prayed. And so it goes throughout church history. You know, I had the wonderful privilege of being the pastor of this church in 1992. That was my first full year. And you know what we were doing? We were worshiping, we were serving God, but guess what else we were doing? We were getting ready to celebrate the centennial that was coming in 1973. And one of the great things is I got to go around to all kinds of folks and sit down, and we still had people here living that had lived during the time when this building was built. I went over to Newell Alexander's house over on Jacob Street then and sat down and she told me as a little girl how she walked down this street and watched the church building here burn down. She also told me about how Bill Sigman, who was just a little boy at that time, pulled her pigtails while she was doing it. <laughs> you didn't know they were cousins, did you? Well, he aggravated the hound out of her, she said, pulling her pigtails. Mm. And then they both sang in this choir later on, <laughs> giving God the glory. I heard lots of stories from a lot of people about lots of things about this congregation right here. And when they rebuilt this building, guess what, Charlie? They did not have a building campaign. They didn't have a building fund. They just started. And the way it worked, I'm told it went like this. People gave money every week. And on Friday, the deacons and this building committee, whose name is out here on this plaque just right outside the doors going into the narthex, stop and read it sometimes. People would give them money and they would pay the workers and they would pay for the materials of that week. And on Monday morning, they would start over anew. Well, as it would happen, it's a Friday afternoon, and they don't have any money. Nobody has made a contribution. No one has given. So what in the world do some of these deacons and some of these elders, what in the world did they do? Now, they met at somebody's house down here on Pink Street, and they were meeting on the front porch and they were sitting out there, but they weren't saying, oh, woe is me. What are we going to do? Somebody's going to have to put their house on the market, you know, to help pay for that. No, they weren't going through all that kind of stuff. They were praying that God would meet their need. Now, Swanee, this sounds too good to be true. But they said, and it was the people who were actually there, some of them still living, telling me this, they said they're there, and about that time, Ms. Rudisel drives up in her car. She gets out and walks around, and she says, you know, my family's been wanting to make a donation to y'all's work on the church over here, but I've been riding around for several weeks with this check in the dash of the car, and I saw y'all were out here, so I'm stopping, and I want to give you that check. And guess what? It covered everything for that week. It covered everything for that week. The prayer of God's people can change things. If we are people of prayer, as we're called to be, we will pray fervently and in faith as we are exhorted to do by God himself that God will change the course of history, the history of our lives, our families, our cities, and our nation. The question of the morning, I guess, is with that in mind, what are you praying for? Well, I'm praying for peace in America. 
I'm praying peace for my soul. How about you? Well, some others are praying just for a good night's sleep to see their family and their friends again without the worry of any kind of COVID or any kind of flu or any kind of RSV or whatever else is swirling around us here. To put your marriage back together, to change something about your job, to find a new job, to live a normal life again, to be able to worship together again, to strengthen you with faith and commitment to Christ and his church. Whatever your request might be, do you earnestly ask God to intervene into your situation? There's an apocryphal story about a man who, after he died, went to heaven. He was given a guided tour. And as he was being shown around the warehouse, uh, full of thousands of boxes of different shapes and sizes, and so he asked St. Peter, what are all of these? And St. Pete says, well, those are the answers to the prayers you never prayed. God had already had them ready to send to you, but you just never asked. You never asked. The great tragedy in life is not an answered prayer, but it's unoffered prayer. As Abraham first bargained with God 3,000 years ago, so we are invited, I should say, we are implored, we are implored by God himself to avail ourselves to the privilege of asking God to intervene into our very lives, into our history, into our time. One of the most astounding teachings of the Bible is that God's people can influence him. Our God is an awesome God. I, I read about an overseas missionary. He was home and he told a story while visiting his, his home church in Ann Arbor, Michigan. You know, this is Mike Atwell's time. He needs to be hearing me say from the pulpit, Michigan. <laughs> but he's not here. Mike, I don't know where you are. But you're missing out big time today because I'm saying it, Michigan, this preacher went back, this missionary, to his home church in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He reminded them that he was serving a small field hospital in Africa and that every two weeks he traveled by, sick, by, by bicycle through the jungle to a nearby city for supplies. It was a two-day journey. Uh, it required camping overnight in, at the halfway point. And on one of those journeys, he arrived in the city where he planned to draw some money out of the bank to purchase medicine and supplies and then return to the field hospital. Well, as he rode through the city, he saw two men fighting. One had been seriously injured. And so he said, I treated him for his injuries and at the same time talked to him about the Lord. And after taking care of my intended business, I began to return trip, camping overnight, and arrived home without uh, incident. Two weeks later, he repeated the same journey. And upon arriving to the city, he was approached by the same guy that he had treated. He told me that he had known that I was carrying money and medicine. And he said, some friends and I follow you, followed you into the jungle. We planned to kill you and to take your money and your drugs. But just as we were about to move unto your camp, we saw that you were surrounded by 26 armed guards. The missionary laughed and said, well, that, that was certainly wrong for he was all alone in the jungle. The young man said, no, sir, my friends also saw them and we counted them. It was because of those guards that we were afraid and so we left you alone. We spared you. At this point in the talk, one of the men of that Michigan church interrupted the missionary and began asking if he could tell him the day this happened. And the missionary told the congregation the date, and the man who interrupted began to tell this story. On the night of your incident in Africa, it was morning here, and I was playing around the golf when I felt the urge to pray for you. In fact, the urging of the Lord was so strong that I called some of the guys to meet me here in the sanctuary to pray for you. And would you 
would, would those men who were with me on that day, would you just please stand up? And the men that had met together and prayed that day stood. And the missionary wasn't concerned with who they were. He was to counting them. Exactly 26. Was it a coincidence? Or was it an answer to prayer? I guess it depends on your point of view. What's yours? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a friend. Catch up with us, Joe. Every, everything to God in prayer. As you make your way back into where you experience your life to its fullest with those whom you love and those with whom you're acquainted, those places where you work and play, remember God has blessed you with a, with a power, a power that we just sort of call it sometimes and take it for granted power call prayer. Use it. Don't lose it. Let not there be found boxes of unoffered prayers in your warehouse when you get to heaven. And as you go and as you live, may you go in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and in the communion of the Holy Spirit.